So, let's start. I'm, um, I am Kostas Lucas, and uh, currently I am the general micro manager of Microsoft uh, in Romania. I've been here for the past uh, two years, uh, and I'm actually enjoying a lot myself. I'm having a, I'm having a great time. Um, but let me, you know, let me roll back a bit and start from from the beginning and try to to walk you through a bit of the choices I had in life. And uh, this is going to be the key the key theme, right? What I will try to to talk about more is not so much about achievements or or you know take this angle, but I will try to take more the angle of choices that I had to make. And uh, looking back, I think we are the sum of those choices, right? I am at least the sum of those choices. And maybe it would be interesting for somebody to you know to listen about how I approached them and how I thought through things and how I came up here, right? So let's start, let's go, let's go way back and go to, to high school. Um, and that was basically, I was, as I, I was born in Athens, Greece. I lived uh, the biggest part of my life there uh, with my parents, both of which were, were teachers. Um, mathematics, my father, and literature, archaeology, my mother. So you can imagine already the, the conflict zone, uh, the positive versus the, you know, the philosophy versus the mathematics the bottom and the top of the pyramid of, uh, of, uh, of sciences. And I was in the middle of all this with, uh, with my brother. Um, but also very intellectually stimulating environment, right? So books and education and learning was a key part of, of what it was, uh, of what our education was about. It was more about what you do with yourself versus what you own. That was the, you know, the, the basic idea of how my, my parents brought us up. And then, uh, uh, interestingly enough, towards the end of, of high school, it was a choice about what you do in life, right? What are you going to study? And it was an interesting time. Uh, most of the people around us and most of my environment was pushing me towards uh, an education around medicine, for example. You know, you're, I was top of my class. I was lucky enough to be top of my class. Uh, very good grades in school and all that. And everybody felt, okay, uh, in Greece it was you know, top students go to medicine, so you have to be a doctor. And I was, I said, no, I don't want to be a doctor. And this is kind of the first thing that I, you know, when I talk especially to, to, to students or to, to younger people, and one of the key things for me, a milestone in my life, was standing up and deciding what's good for you. And even if you're 17 or 16 years old, where I was at the time, I think it was a very important decision, and it actually um, you know, drove a lot of what I became, right? And uh, the reasoning was very grounded, right? I didn't, first of all, I didn't want to spend all that, that much time studying. And second of all, I was just not drawn into it. I was more drawn into other things like people, relationships, uh, in terms of um, society, how it's working. I was more interested in listening about the economy, listening about the history versus how our body works, right? And I didn't enjoy that much also blood, so I said, you know, maybe I can pass the exam, most probably, and maybe I can get in the university, but then the second year you have to start dissecting people, <laughs> bodies, I said, no, I would probably fail at that point. So the first choice was about, uh, was about um, uh, education and, uh, and, my, and my studies. And then I started in the university, I started studying economics, and I felt that was, um, that was the right choice for me. Economics is an interesting science. Some people say it's not a science because if you put two economists in a room, you can get up to three or four different views. So, you know, for some people it's not so much a science. For me it is. It's a very good combination of uh, behavior, so behavioral part, and microeconomics especially, how the, the whole thing is found, founded, and then of course the mathematical part and the statistics, econometrics, which is also equally interesting. Um, but the, what I tried to do more during those time of my studies is I said, okay, I am here, I'm lucky enough that so that I'm in the university and I can study. What about I enrich, I open up? And I tried to do all kinds of, uh, of different things during my studies. So I got involved in a number of groups doing a variety of things from, I don't know, from arts to politics to anything I could get uh, my, my, you know, my brain around. And um, I thought it was a very good experience to enrich, right, to, to broaden. And also, I, I like economics because it's exactly about that. 
it's all overly focused on one side. It's not, let's say, economic history or you know finance or stock market analysis. It's more broad. It talks about you know the the evolution of capitalism also in the past two three hundred years. It was a very interesting, uh, very interesting topic. And also, what I tried to do during my studies is I thought it would be interesting to start also finding some interest internships, start working, and that was. Uh, also very tough to get, but I was able to land the job. So while I was studying and while I was um, studying economics, I found a job as a junior analyst in a small firm that was doing economic studies. I was pretty proud of myself. I found this job without any help, any external help, and I, that's where I started. That was where my first job. Before that, I did some, you know, funny jobs in, in high school, um, but this was the first real job where you have to show up every morning and you have to you know, deliver something at the end of the day where you have a boss and you have this whole type of relationship. And um, now this was back in uh, 1996 and uh, so a lifetime ago, 20 years ago, my god, yes. And then I, I, as I was working, a first, um, a first opportunity came towards my way. And I was—I remember—I was reading the newspaper, and I thought that I saw this, you know, this advertisement. It was uh, Procter and Gamble at the time, and they—they they had a program for students, and they were looking to take 50 students across Europe and the Middle East, and uh, run a seminar for five days. So it was an opportunity. It was in the big press in Greece, so I, I assumed that you know probably hundreds of people will go for it, and I kind of, you know, I was looking at it. Uh, I was. You know, double guessing myself, should I do it, should I not, would it be a waste of my time? So I just left the paper. And um, it was the morning paper, and I went to work, I came back home, and then my mother was there. I remember her. She took she, she had this opened up in front of her. She said, This is the opportunity. Why aren't you applying this? And, you know, uh, you maybe it's kind of, you know, who would think of me? And she said, Come on, why don't you try? And uh, and there's a big learning there, but sometimes we kind of tend to underestimate ourselves or, you know, even if you try to be humble and uh, balanced about yourself, nothing will happen unless you go after it, right? So things don't happen by themselves. You have to chase a bit your luck, as we say in Greek. So I said, okay, I will apply. What do I have to lose? And I wrote down the letter. The same night, wrote the letter, did my CV. I didn't have a CV, to be honest, and a good one. I put everything together, everything I could together. Uh, now looking back at that CV, I think it's very funny. So if I, if I, sometimes I come across that CV and it's a very good joke for my friends when we gather around because it has a number of things that you do when you're a high school student. But it kind of, when I you know look at it from the real HR perspective, what it shows is that there is a person there that has really tried to, to do as much as they can from their life until that 16, 17, 19 years old. So I sent it over and surprise they invited me for um, a test. It was a numerical test. I was pretty good at those things, so I went. I went through this, started the interviews, went through the interview process, and at the end, they actually took me. They said, "You know, this is the guy we want." And it was a competition between two, three hundred people, so it was an interesting outcome. And I had the opportunity to go to Rome at the time, first time in Rome, also uh, engaging with uh, with Procter and Gamble organization. It was pretty intense, and then. Another choice comes up, right? I come back, I've, I'm finishing the university at the same time, I just did this, and what Proctor says is, listen, why don't you join us? Come work with us. We think you have the right profile, and you should, uh, you know, join us. It's a big organization. Why don't you come? And uh, that was the one option. The other option was uh, military service. I had to do compulsory military service in Greece. And you can postpone it, right? And you can do all kinds of things, but at some point you have to do it, and you, the, actually the earlier the better. Um, but of course I could postpone it. And then there was the third idea around the master's degree. How, so I had three pieces of, you know, very conflicting options in front of me. And again, I mean, it was about, okay, well, should I go for the army and get it over with and get it out? Um, but of course the downside is that you know, that opportunity goes away and also you, could, you lose your connection with your science. Should I go for the master's degree, which I'm ready, I just finished university, I have some experience, or should I go for the job, which is, come on, it's Procter & Gamble, one of the top global companies, how often do you get that on the table? 
it was, I remember I wouldn't sleep, I was you know, days after days I was thinking about it. And um, to make it even harder, I already had submitted some applications to see what the, the, the traction would be for a master's degree in the UK. And Cambridge came back and said, we would like you to come for the MPhil in economics, master of philosophy in economics in Cambridge. So I so said, it was becoming even more harder now. Um, again, what I really appreciated from my family is at that point, there was no, although there was help in terms of clarifying the options, there was no push. So I remember, I very clearly remember that it was my choice. And you know, my father at the time said, my father, it's all the time, but said, you know, my son, we trust you completely. I mean, do what you think is right. So I said, okay. I think what's right now is I'm 22. I think I should go to the army now and finish with it. So I said to Procter & Gamble, see you soon, I'll come back. Please keep it for me. Of course, you know, that was a bit out there. And I said, okay, with Cambridge I won't go. I will try again. I think I can get it again. And I went to the army. So I started my compulsory military service. Um, interesting time. And then what comes, the learning comes at the beginning, and most people tend to think of the army as lost time, right? You go there and one and a half years was at the time, and you feel like it's lost time, and what are you going to do there? It's, it can be really boring. Um, I tried to do the best out of it, the most out of it. So I volunteered to go to the Special Forces. It's not very intuitive. That, that's a different side of my father at the time. what are you doing? You are educated, you are, why, why are you going to do this? My approach was that, you know, if I'm there, I want to do the best, the most. Let's max it out. Let's see what is the most this, um, this opportunity can give me. And actually, I had a very interesting, a very interesting, let's say, military service uh, in the Special Forces, amphibious operations. It was a, a very good time, and uh, there are some lessons that I learned there good and bad lessons that I'm still holding with me. I mean, the army type of organization is not something that I would like to be part of for a long time. Like, it's not my, my style. Uh, at the same time, you learn a lot about people, and especially how they react under, the, under pressure. First of all, you realize what real pressure is, right? And in the business context, <laughs> sometimes we say pressure, okay, it's, it's a scale down, let's say the pressure that you face in, a, in the army context versus um, uh, especially in an operation context versus uh, uh, the business context. You learn a lot about, about how people, and also you learn a lot about yourself and what are your capabilities, what you can do. Somehow we set our own boundaries, both physically, interestingly enough, and mentally. So it's not just mental, it's kind of, it's a, there's a correlation between the two. And um, that experience helped me a lot to push my boundaries further, to realize that, okay, it's not just, I can do much more than I thought I could do, with real examples, right? And especially in life, the lessons that combine intellectual and physical are the lessons that you, you never forget. And this was uh, that, that period. So, some interesting learnings, also some negative sides about, you know, how I can be, how I can be a lot, um, you know, tougher than I would like to be in situations or um, less democratic in other types of situations. I came back as a trainer at the end of the, of the, of the tour, so I also had the experience of, uh, of training others, and I was dismissed with uh, with honors at the end. Um, and then, of course, we're back in the same option, with one less. Will you go to work, try to find a job, or would I go for uh, for a master's degree? For a master's degree. And at the time, I reapplied, and guess what? Cambridge did not accept me. It was gone. And that was also a very interesting learning because I realized that, you know, choices have a cost. And it's it's something that you, we, you know, we need to be aware of. Sometimes we spend too much time uh, debating with choices, trying to find the one that has no cost. Well, it doesn't exist. Something is ringing. Well, it doesn't exist. Choices do have a cost. And this, is, uh, this was the cost at the time. I lost that opportunity. But, interestingly enough, I had the opportunity from London School of Economics. Um, a master's degree in finance and economics. I went there. 
in uh, 98 I started it I mean, right after you know special forces type of surrounding being with guys all day long running around and doing all those things to London UK very nice uh, environment studying what I really really liked it was a big contradiction like from hell to, <laughs> to paradise and it was one of the best years of my life I really enjoyed the process I really enjoyed the learning I I really had a great time also meeting people from different cultures completely both women and men which was also very very good after just spending two years with guys it was good to kind of have this mixed environment around me and um, it came out very well I actually graduated uh, with honors again and I was top of my class with uh, distinction so it was a very very fulfilling uh, fulfilling experience and at the end what happens? Another choice comes, right, at the end of my studies. And the choice was, would I stay in the UK or London or try to get a job there, or would I go back to, to Athens, Greece? Um, and also the choice had a, a further duality. In the, in the UK, I had the opportunity to go in a, more towards a financial investment banking type of, type of career. In Athens, it was more would be more in the, in the industry type of consumer products type of, of career. And um, for a lot of people, it's, there's no choice, right? From many people will tell you that the, the monetary, let's say, value of one to the other is scales up, right? Um, but for me, that was not uh, the, the angle I was taking. I was thinking about, okay, I, I was 24, 25, I said, I would like to, to have a balanced life. I want to have a career, but at the same time, I want to have great stories with my friends. I want to have a connection with my family and my loved ones. Um, so, you know, it's good that I'm, you know, I'm proud that I have this option, but I would rather go back and start with the industry. And um, I've never regretted it. Like, I have friends that went the other way and they are now very well celebrated and they really had a great time on this. Um, I have also great stories to share until I was uh, 32, 35. So the next seven years were great uh, time for me. So I came back and uh, interestingly enough what Proctor did is they kept my CV. So it was three years afterwards, they still kept my CV, I went there, I tried to to meet the CFO at the time uh, because it was a financial uh, position. I tried to meet the CFO and um, you know with the nerve of a, of a younger guy I said uh, I called up his office and I said could I please have an appointment with the CFO and everybody was asking PA, what, who are you first of all? <laughs> said, um, Costas. Said, okay, why would you like to meet the CFO? I said, uh, three years ago I was there and I did this and maybe there is something. So let's book you. And they booked me for two, two weeks later. I visited the, the, the guy, great mentor at the time and really made a great contribution and impact to my career. I went to his office and I remember he was, uh, you know, he was older, he had his glasses. He, I sat, he took off his glasses, he looked at me and said, okay, so what do you want? Why are you here? I said, I'm here to work. <laughs> so he said, okay, he said. And then it was interesting, laughing, he was smiling, he said, what is funny is that we just have an opening. So it was, and now looking back, it was really luck, right? I just walked in the time they had the opening and they kept my file. So it's a number of things that aligned, a number of stars that aligned for me to get that, uh, that job. But again, if I wasn't there, if I didn't try it, it wouldn't have happened. So I started working in Procter & Gamble and then I, you know, it was uh, again a very good experience. For the next three years I rotated in a number of departments and I'm very happy and proud that I started this company because Procter, what Procter does is it recruits directly from university and it offers a good, uh, it's a very good first experience for, for people. It helps you, uh, you know, formulate your thinking about and it helps you enter a working environment and have a work ethos and a work style that can serve you in the majority of, uh, of companies. So I started working there, I moved around from finance and sales department and marketing. I spent some time there and another choice came across. Um, Three years passed. I had the offer, the option of going to Geneva and working for headquarters type of roles in Procter, 
and I had the option to go work for a different company. Uh, but then I would be, uh, you know, working with a team. I would become a manager for the first time. And I was trying to, you know, to balance out and assess the options. And um, my heart was more into people. I said, I think that, you know, I wasn't a manager before. I, I sensed that this would be more my calling. I, I had a big interest around, around people, teams, collaboration, how you inspire people, how you work with them. This whole thing gave me a lot of energy also. So, and in Procter it would take me some years to get there. So I made the choice and I jumped boats and I moved to Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company. And I worked there for another three years. I gained a number of jobs and um, also as a young manager I started working with smaller smaller teams in the beginning and then uh, the roles started, started growing. A very fulfilling experience. Again, moving from fast moving consumer goods to beverages, both companies, different cultures, but again a lot of similarities. Um, companies with a long, long history, uh, very strong brands, very marketing at their DNA, um, great people to work with. Um, I was really, really privileged and really, really lucky to do this. And as I was in, in finance, I was thinking about my path to, to a CFO position. And um, there was one area that I haven't, I hadn't done, right? And a learning and an option comes up, as you can see, life can, keeps on bringing those things in front of us. And uh, there was the technical part of uh, accounting, taxation, these type of things I wasn't into. I was more interested for the business, more interested about the marketing side, the sales side of things. But I knew in order to be a CFO, you have, you have to do it. So an opportunity came up with Microsoft at the time, and um, I took it. So I joined Microsoft uh, as a controller, um, head of, a, of the team that did all the infrastructure part of the business, so the accounting part, the taxation part, in the middle of a very big tax audit, in the middle of a, a migration of systems, very, very technical. So exactly what it was not intuitive. And the learning of this is that sometimes you, you know, there are things that if you want to get to a certain place, there are things, some of the things you will like, some of the things are not definitely going to be the best things you enjoy, but, you know, you have to swallow the medicine if you want to be a complete professional in, uh, especially leading a team, especially being a CFO. And um, I did my best, I didn't particularly enjoy it. Uh, but I had very good outcomes at the end, and at the end of the year, um, I was fortunate that Microsoft uh, saw something in me, and I was put as the head of the finance department. I became a CFO for Microsoft Greece when I was 30. Um, so that was the, the you know the journey wrapping up the first 10 years from 20 to, to 30, I would say, and then I kind of I was thinking about what is next. I spent the next three years working as a CFO and I, 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 I learned a lot of things. It's different when you are part of a team in a specific um, segment of the business and it's different when you sit on a board. You, you tend to see the business left to right, you understand a, a bigger variety of problems and you have the responsibility of leading an organization um, in, in, a, in a market. A lot of, uh, of experiences. And then I was trying to think, okay, how do I enrich myself? What is next? What is next for me? Um, what should I, you know, what should I be thinking? And um, interestingly enough, I had a lot of people talking to me about even more technical knowledge, right? Um, but I felt I needed to do something more around people. I felt that the, the more you move in an organization and the more you progress, the more important relationships and understanding of, of people becomes. So I decided to do a diploma in executive coaching, and I spent quite some time. And since then, I'm I'm, I'm doing this very very happily. It's the highlight probably of my day. I have active coaching relationships with both colleagues and people from other companies. It's something that I really enjoy, and uh, I think it's one of the things I do well. Right, so allow me this a bit of arrogance on this. It's something that I like a lot and I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. So I did a bit of coaching then, 
And the big question was, what would I do next? Would I continue on a finance track, try to get to another job of CFO, or would I try something different? And um, I decided to move to the business and uh, did marketing and operations. At the same time, I, I started an executive MBA in ASEAD. Um, and I did them simultaneously. And I was also lucky enough to, to, to have my daughter. So my daughter was born in the same year. So in the same year, I have a daughter, an executive MBA, and I switched jobs to marketing and operations. It was a very interesting year. I guess part of my wrinkles and white hair were during that year. But also very fulfilling personally uh, that year. Um, I learned a lot of things and I broadened a lot myself uh, professionally. I learned that uh, sometimes you need to take a risk even though you may have a very secure way in a, in a career, a very secure financial way in terms of uh, being in, the, in a CFO position. Changing that really reinvigorates and helps you reinvent yourself and think of yourself differently. And from there on, it was really accelerated. Things really accelerated for me. Um, I had the opportunity and I was offered uh, my first GM job at 36, 37, and I moved to Cyprus and Malta at the time. Had a great time there we, we, with the team. Uh, smaller markets, but also challenging because the, the resources are completely different. Less resources, but equal challenges to a big market. Spent there one and a half, close to two years, and that drove me to where I am now. Romania. I came two years ago. The organization at the time was um, three, around 350 people. Now we are exceeding 700 people in Romania. For Microsoft, Romania is an important hub for Eastern Europe. We have here, besides the commercial operation, we have um, a support center uh, with engineers serving customers and contracts across EMEA, especially with new workloads around, uh, around cloud. So it's a key market uh, for Romania and I'm proud to be be part of it, right, and also actually to lead in the local organization. Um, this is, in short, the story. Um, I'm 40 now. I, I had my birthday in September. So, uh, and every 10 years, like I told you about 30, every 10 years, I like to, to, to look back and think about what I, what I wanted to do and what I did at the end, and I also try to think about what's next. And uh, I want to be, uh, you know, to, I want to think of things both in terms of being humble, but also in terms of being aspirational about yourself, you know, setting standards. And I'm happy with what has happened. Um, I'm happy with the people I have around me, with the relationship I have around me, um, with the way I've built my life. Um, but also I feel I have more things to do, right? I have uh, other aspirations. Uh, for the next 10 years, 50 is going to be the next mark, so we can meet again at 50 and discuss what happened there. And, um, and that's it. Um, that's what I had to share. <laughs>